Once again, loving Father, it is our privilege and honor to study together the Word of God. We realize that you've honored your Word above your name, and therefore we give it a special place in our lives and a priority in our lives so that we may advance spiritually and come to appreciate who and what you are and all that you've provided for us. May the end result be that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, be glorified uh, because of our study this evening, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. By the way, with the cold weather, we have been inundated with a, with a uh, herd of mice. And uh, so if something runs across your foot, don't get too nervous. I don't know why. I don't think they'll come in here, but they're, uh, they're finding places around the building, particularly the drawers of my desk. And we're going to have the we, we're going to have a bunch of mice with the cleanest smelling breath you've ever had. I had a roll of breath mints in my desk drawer, and they attacked and chomped those things down almost to the nubs, uh, so that they've really got great breath. The certs breath mints, but uh, we're going to try to get some uh, decon mouse proof and stick it around, and let them go and die somewhere else. Yeah, well, okay. we'll try that. Uh, we, my, my mouse traps are all right, but I think we got a herd. I mean, I mean, I think they committed a herd. I, I and I, I just want you to know, though, that uh, I don't picture uh, uh, Mickey Mouse or Minnie Mouse eating those things out of my desk. Nor do I picture uh, Speedy Gonzales uh, uh, or Jerry of Tom and Jerry. I picture a, a rodent. And I don't mind. I wouldn't mind putting a bullet through their brain if I wasn't. Uh, if I didn't have a 44 Magnum, uh, that would probably blow the whole desk apart. Uh, so I won't uh, start driving around. I remember the time Dar had some uh, birds in his <clears throat> in his <laughs> attic, and he called the squirrels. Oh, <laughs> he called. Uh, old sharpshooter <laughs> Greg Steer to come over and get rid of him, and Greg came with his gun and. From that time on, he had holes in his roof. But <laughs> anyway, it is it isn't easy to do uh, that way. There must be an easier way. Cats, yeah, but some of them are so lazy they do, they just look there and watch them go by and say, "Can I help you?" Like Garfield does. Um, uh, all right, we're in the doctrine of paterology, and many people will say, "What in the world is paterology?" Well, the Greek word for father is pater, which looks like this in the Greek. P-A-T, this is the eta, pater. And the ology, of course, like anything that has to, ends in that, is the study of uh, the father. Now, uh, in the principle of Bible doctrine, uh, all doctrine begins with the milk of the word, the milk of the word is Bible doctrine, which is relatively easy to understand. It's very simplified. Uh, not there aren't a whole lot of doctrines, but uh, rebound is one. Maybe though not the whole doctrine, but at least the principle of rebound. Faith rest is another. Uh, the essence of God. These are uh, these are milk doctrines. They're easy to digest and uh, become a part of you, but. Once you build upon uh, the milk doctrines, uh, the, the doctrines which are meat, we have to understand that the meat of the word is hard to digest. It's, it's more difficult. Uh, but I can't limit myself just to teaching milk, though there are some members of the congregation who are not prepared for going on beyond the milk of the word of God. Uh, the doctrine of paterology is not milk. The uh, as he says in uh, uh, in Hebrews chapter five, uh, when talking about the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ and his superiority, he begins by talking about his superiority to angels, then his superiority to Moses, then his superiority to uh, uh, Aaron, then his superiority to Melchizedek, and uh, he's. Uh, He's talking about this uh, superiority when he stops in Hebrews 5.11 and says, We have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, he says, 
though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of, uh, uh, of food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to be distinct to distinguish good from evil. So you have there the the statement about the difference between milk and meat, and uh, uh, it's true that 90 percent of all believers uh, are still babes, never having grown, and are in need of milk. But uh, my policy of teaching the Word of God does not permit me to limit myself to that. Because my policy is and has been now for 25 years to teach the Word of God word by word and verse by verse. And when I come in a verse word by word, as I have in Galatians chapter 1, verse 3, I come to the word grace, I stop and teach the doctrine of grace. Then I come to the word peace and I teach the doctrine of peace. Then I come to the uh, statement from God our Father. Now, uh, having come to this, I have to stop and I have to deal with this uh, doctrine of God our Father. And it is not a simple doctrine, though what we have covered thus far is sort of simple. So for about a, uh, a week or ten days, I've been racking my brain to think of a way to make this a little more clear and uh, somehow to uh, visualize it for you. Uh, for example, if you'll notice in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 uh, through 8, we have uh, the statement which is uh, uh, made uh, it, that is absolutely fantastic, one of the most profound and uh, deep statements in all the Word of God. It contains uh, five aorist tenses. Uh, 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 three are aorist indicatives, and two are aorist participles. Now, the aorist is a, is, is a beautiful tense. It refers to an occurrence, something that uh, is, uh, has taken place. Sometimes it's an, an occurrence in eternity past. In this case, all of these are occurrences in eternity past. The word that aorist comes from is uh, the word horizo or horizon. And the point of horizon is that when you look at the horizon, you get the picture of the whole thing. And that's what the aorist tense is designed to do, give you a picture of the whole thing. And so when we have aorist tense, uh, we have uh, the picture of the whole thing. And in these, in these verses, God has given us the five-fold picture of what God the Father has done for every believer. And I'll read the passage, then go back and just refer to you uh, them to you and then we'll come later on in our study and look at each one individually but beginning in Ephesians 1 3 it says praise be to the God even father of our Lord Jesus Christ so we know the subject here who is the subject God the father the first aorist uh, is the aorist participle from hath blessed us so we have the the first one is who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. This is the iteration of the fact that God has provided for you a portfolio of invisible assets. That is his divine statement. Verse 4, For he chose us in him. The aorist indicative chose us. In him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Then the third, in love he predestined us. This is the aorist participle, again, the second of the, three, uh, the uh, two aorist participles. Uh, in love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves now this is 
this is mistranslated in the King James Version, accepted in the Beloved. That is not the word at all. The word which is translated, accepted in the Beloved One, is charis. Charis is grace. And that word really means He has graced us out. And this is another aorist indicative. He has graced us out. Again, all these errors, remember that. This all took place in eternity past. He has graced us out uh, in the one whom he loves, the beloved one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. The word he lavished on us is the fifth of the aorist tense. It's the aorist indicative. And it is uh, to cause to superabound. That is, his, uh, super, he has caused grace to superabound toward us. And uh, uh, these five uh, beautiful words describe the fantastic work of God in the provision of the portfolio of invisible assets. God the Father does certain things for you. God the Holy Son, God the Son does certain things for you. And God the Holy Spirit does certain things for you. We use the term portfolio because portfolio uh, refers to the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 where the deposit of uh, uh, all of your securities and your assets are located. Uh, in the business world, you have a portfolio. It includes your bonds, your stocks, your real estate, all of the assets that belong to you. You have a few uh, uh, stocks in one company. You have a little gold, a little silver. It doesn't, uh, uh, have, it doesn't count your wife or your children, which are probably your greatest assets, but they're not there as far as the human is concerned. But it can, the port, your portfolio includes all of the, the securities and assets that God the Father has provided for your blessing in eternity past. In eternity past, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit had the Eternal Life Conference. Now, we recognize that these are really just titles for the three persons of the Godhead. They are three persons eternally existing as one God. We spent some time working on that. But God the Father... And so we'll put this up here. God the Father, from the source of three things, from the source of His sovereignty, His uh, uh, fantastic love, and His omniscience, has come up with the portfolio of invisible assets for all believers. Now, this portfolio of invisible assets, I'm going to transfer that up here, and I, what I, uh, I've asked Bill uh, to, to take my diagram and to spiff it up, and he has come up with a very fine way to do it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the young man came to fix the copy machine today and found out that the, the bulb is burned out, and he, <laughs> poor guy, had to go back to Ohio and bring another one out tomorrow. So we weren't able to get this... Uh, copied for you, but we will have it copied, and uh, some of you will get tired of this by the time I'm finished with it, because I'm going to be using it for several Bible classes. Hopefully, it'll become so indwell so uh, repetitious that you'll be able to close your eyes at night and see it on the ceiling of your bedroom, because you'll, you will talk about loving God and worshiping God. You'll talk about uh, having a great relationship with God, and it's not true. You don't. You can't love someone you don't know. You can't worship a God that you don't know anything about. And going through some idiotic uh, emotional gimmickry is not worship. Singing isn't worship unless it comes from the soul. They to worship Him, worship Him in this from the spirit that's inside of us, and on the basis of Bible doctrine, truth. And anybody can say, oh, I love you. It's just like a guy with a mouth full of teeth 
talks to some uh, innocent young girl and says, I love you. What he means is I like your body. That's all I want. He doesn't mean I love you, but if he's got a mouthful of teeth and she's arrogant, she believes him. If she knew the truth, she, she probably would say, well, take it anyway. Nobody else wants it. But anyway, the point is, uh, you could say anything. I love you. A man says this, tells his wife, I love you, and then treats her like dirt. That's not love. Ridiculous. And you say, oh, Father, I love you. People sing about loving the Father. Oh, how I love Jesus. They don't love someone they, can't, they don't know. And this is designed to help you to know that God the Father has provided a portfolio of invisible assets. Now, this comes in four assets, four types of assets. There are primary assets, there are secondary assets, there are personnel assets, and there are unique assets. Now, I'm going to develop each of these for you, uh, but I want you to see the whole thing uh, in, in picture form, in this uh, diagram form. Now, the, uh, and I'm going to work backwards because I'm going to spend my time on the primary assets. I want you to understand what these primary assets are. The unique assets uh, there, uh, in your portfolio are the indwelling of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All three members of the Godhead indwell you as a believer. Now this has never been true in all of human history. This is not true of any Old Testament saint. It will not be true of any saint of the millennium. It is true only of believers who came to know Jesus Christ as their Savior between the day of Pentecost and the day of the rapture of the church. Once the rapture of the church takes place, this unique asset will no longer be a part of the, uh, anybody's portfolio. But, beloved, this is for all believers good, bad, or indifferent, in or out of fellowship, whether they are in reversionism, in fragmentation, wherever they are, everyone is indwelt by all three members of the uh, divine trinity. You are indwelt by God the Father to guarantee that this is all true. Now, going backwards, personnel assets, or we could call it service assets, are spiritual gifts that God has provided to every believer. These are the assets which are yours. They're invisible. Nobody can see them. Nobody can tell what spiritual gifts you have by looking at you. But at the point of salvation, when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you were given at least one spiritual gift for the purpose of being uh, uh, in the, the service of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now, when we come to secondary assets, the, the primary and secondary assets work on the basis uh, of uh, they're, they're related. The primary assets have to do with God. The secondary assets have to do with you as a believer. So I'm going to take and separate this part onto a clean sheet. I'm going to take primary assets over here, and I'm going to take secondary assets and put them over here. Now, the secondary assets will only function uh, as, the, as you utilize the primary assets. And if you don't use the primary assets, the secondary assets aren't going to work. The secondary assets are fourfold. The first is volitional assets. This is the volitional opportunity that every believer has to make his own choice, his own decisions as to what is the number one priority of his life. It is a response to the primary assets, which you will see. The second is uh, production assets. The production assets are the filling or the control of God the Holy Spirit, which is also related to, number one, uh, our primary assets, as you will see in a moment. Uh, the third of the secondary assets is suffering for blessing. That God has provided certain uh, three types of suffering, for the purpose of blessing the believer here on this earth in a way that he could never bless him in eternity future. And then fourthly, there is personal impact uh, uh, assets, those things 
that God has provided for you so that you can have a fantastic personal impact uh, in, in life. Now, when we come to the primary assets that God has provided, there are two. Uh, and uh, uh, again, I don't know, if, uh, from time to time, uh, I have to depend on the nomenclature that Colonel Theme has come up with. Though I, I do not like it, I can't come up with a better one. I wish I could. Uh, this is not a very good way, but it's, I'm, I'm going to call it computer assets, and I'll explain why uh, after a bit. Why do I call them computer assets? Be, well, he calls them that, and I understand why. Uh, but the computer assets, which are twofold, they are election and predestination. Each of these has equal privilege and equal opportunity there are, uh, under each one. And they result in the second of the primary assets, which are called escrow assets, and these are related to both time and eternity. In other words, the basis for the fantastic blessing that God has for you in time and eternity depends upon the computer assets that He has provided for you. The difference between election and predestination very quickly and very simply. Uh, first of all, let us understand that the election and predestination has absolutely nothing to do with the unsaved. God has never, ever elected some people to go to heaven and some people to go to hell. He has never predestined or predetermined that some people would go to heaven and some people would go to hell. Predestination and election both relate to the same thing, that is, believers. In a computer, you have a ROM chip and a PROM chip. Now, what's the difference? The ROM chip is programmed at the... Uh, it stands for read-only memory. This stands for programmable read-only memory. Now, that computer, they have uh, put into it unchangeable information. That can't be touched by anybody it's programmed at the factory and you can't do anything with that it's it, it's the ROM chip programmable is that when they make a read-only memory means that they have designed something at the factory that you can do something with by the use of following certain uh, instructions uh, you can uh, program this the read-only memory so that it, fa it, it it's usable for uh, certain programs but you can only do what that program that uh, a programmable chip lets you do I mean you you take my computer and it's limited because the language is that of the Apple computer company and you start to do something that has to do with the uh, with uh, the IBM and uh, my machine will come out and say boop bing boop boop I O input error and it'll just keep going you can do everything you want it'll say I O I O input error and it'll never do anything else you see and uh, uh, now the, the the two major companies have finally I thought they should have done it years ago but competition was so great the Apple and it's not the everything it's the Macintosh and the PC they've come together with a language that'll talk to each other finally for after all these years isn't that amazing Finally, they have something that will talk to each other. But here's how it works out. You see, the omniscience of God in eternity past knew every decision that you would make, knew every choice you would make, knew every uh, 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 action you would take, and in eternity past programmed that into the prom chip so that this is something that is, has nothing to do with you. This has something to do with your free will and volition. 
but how your free will and volition operated in time was recorded in eternity past. And there it is, which means, therefore, that in eternity past, God knew whether you'd be a winner or a loser. Now, you say, you mean I have no control over it? Well, you, yes, you have all the control, but God knew exactly what control you're going to take or not take. Say, if I walk out of the building tonight, and I, if I want to turn right, and does predestination say I have to turn left? No, predestination did, says that God already knew which way you'd turn. Program that into your, uh, your uh, computer assets and made use that if either to help you grow or not. See, every time you have a choice, let's say, to go to Bible class, and you say, now I have a choice to make. Will I go or won't I? Well, if I, you say yes, God knew in eternity past that you would make that choice. And therefore, it's already programmed. It's predestined to take place. It's programmed already there, uh, determined in advance. On the basis of what? On the basis of the decision that you would make, since omniscience knew the decision you would make before you were even born, before you were even thought of, before the world was created. God's omniscience knew every decision you'd make. That's why God knew that certain believers would be losers. And he's determined to bless them anyway with the blessings of election and predestination, but they will never ever have the blessings of escrow blessing because they have made these choices which are negative. They will never ever have it because from the computer assets, they have all of the positive things that God provided, but they made negative decisional choices again, again, and again, and they end up losers. They're losing. Now, beloved, the, here's the problem. There's nothing in life to illustrate this. We can illustrate the Trinity with an, with an egg. It has yolk. It has the, uh, the uh, white. It has the, the, the shell. Uh, we can illustrate it with light. It's, uh, some light is actinic. Some is luminiferous. Some is uh, 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 calorific. I hate calories, so I... That's why it slips my mind. But, but there's no illustration of this. There's no way that anybody can, can really grasp the fact that there is such a fantastic being who, in his omniscience, knew everything. There is absolutely nothing that God's omniscience did not know in eternity past. And knowing absolutely everything, he has taken that into his account. Now let's let me take just this part and a, and amplify it just a little to show you what I mean when I say that God has given equal privilege and equal opportunity so that if you want to be a loser it's your choice and not his. There is nobody who's going to be a loser except those who say to God and I'm saying that literally that's exactly what they do. They thumb their nose at God. And they're going to be a loser in spite of everything that God the Father has already done for them. You can understand why it's so reprehensible in the eyes of God that there should be a human being who is so arrogant and so stupid as to thumb their nose at God. But there are. All right, here we have primary assets. And then under this we have, let's take computer assets. Now let's take over here, let's put election. Now under election, we have recorded God's desire for every believer. What does God want for you? Beloved of God, He wants the very best. That's why he gave Jesus Christ to die on the cross, so that you could have the best in life. Now, wait a minute. Remember at the very beginning, I'm talking here about invisible assets. As soon as I say you have the best in life, some of you immediately talk about being a millionaire or driving a Mercedes or a Corvette or a Jaguar or something like that, or living on a South Sea island in the middle of the hurricane or whatever. Some of you think of those. I'm talking about invisible assets, things that can never be seen. 
But election records God's desire. Predestination records God's provision so that this desire can be realized in your life. All right? Now, the equal privilege of this election is that every believer who is elected by God is a part of the universal priesthood of every believer. You see, you are a priest, whether you know it or not. What does that mean? The universal priesthood of every believer means this. You do not need anybody else to represent you before the God of the universe. You have access to God. That's a part of your portfolio of invisible assets. And for anybody to presume to be a priest to represent you is to blaspheme the work of God and the finished work of Christ on the cross. It says very clearly in, in uh, Timothy, there is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So we know there is no such thing as any mediatorship. But it leaves there for you yourself. And we as believers are called a kingdom of priests. So we have a universal priesthood for every believer. That's for winners and losers alike. So if you want to be a loser... In life, you're going to be a loser in spite of the fact that God has given you this fantastic access to Him. That you can come boldly to the throne of grace and there to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He, uh, Hebrews chapter 4. You uh, uh, have also uh, access uh, into this grace wherein you stand. Uh, Romans chapter 5. You have access to God. And it doesn't need a special place. You don't need a church. You don't need a, a, a building. You can have access anywhere at any time because of your universal priesthood. Now, equal opportunity says that he has provided for all believers logistical grace, provision, and blessing. Now, please note, no volition is involved in this. This has nothing to do with any volition. This is the, that God's desire to, to do something wonderful for you uh, is, first of all, to make you a priest representing yourself to God. The opportunity is that every believer, no matter who he is, no matter where he lives, no matter what his background, no matter how much he knows or doesn't know, he has logistical grace provisions. And we've just finished studying logistical grace, so you are well acquainted with what logistical grace is all about. It's everything that God can do to not only take care of you, but to bless you in this life, totally apart from earning or deserving. Grace says you'll never earn it or you'll never deserve it. He does it for you on the basis of His character. He, and it's, it's, it's given to us under the words... Uh, in the passage which we looked at, Ephesians 1, the, the, the better translation of accepted in the beloved, he has graced us out. That's what this means. He has graced us out for all of eternity. That's the, that is the, the computer asset election. Now, again, that shows God's desire. Now, over here, we have predestination. See, that's the, the, this is the first one. This is the second. Now, predestination, as I said, shows God's provision. And, in other words, in order for you to have everything that God desires, He has made a fantastic provision for you. And the equal privilege... And the equal opportunity, again, are related to what he has provided. Now, the, first, the equal privilege is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which placed you into union with the Lord Jesus Christ, 
resulting in your being royal family, whether you know it, whether you like it, or whether you appreciate it or not. You are royal family. You're, you will always be royal family. There's no way you will not be royal family. And the Jews of the Old Testament were the family of God, not royal family. The, uh, the millennial kingdom saints will not be royal family. Royal family, those of the church age and only of the church age. The equal opportunity is that God has provided a divine sphere of power, your own palace for the royalty to live, and that palace provides you everything necessary for you to fulfill the plan of God for your life. All right? Now that's... These are God's provisions for you from election and predestination. Now watch. You'll see in a moment how this all comes together, I hope. All right? So we have primary assets, election, predestination, equal privilege, equal opportunity, and these result in escrow assets. That is, uh, God has deposited in your account some fantastic blessing, unthought of, undreamed of, unbelievable. They're so great that God cannot reveal them to you. These fantastic escrow blessing that He has for you. And uh, the, some you will receive in time when you reach spiritual maturity. Others you will only receive, receive in eternity at the judgment seat of Christ. So this is how this works. Now let's look how this works with the secondary assets. Here is where God gives you the privilege of utilizing, one, your volition. Will you be a winner or a loser? Your volition will determine that. That's entirely up to you. Will you take advantage of the filling of the Holy Spirit by the use of rebound and confession of sin? Or will you operate under energy of the flesh and be a loser? In eternity past, God knew whether how you would respond to the secondary assets and whether He's given you uh, all of these things so that you could, uh, you could achieve this. But here's where your volition comes in. Eternity past, He knew that volitional choice. And it's a recorded, uh, whether you're a winner or a loser, on the basis of how you have utilized this. The third, how have you responded to suffering for blessing? Has it been one moan after another, or has it been the realization that God is blessing you? And then, how have you noted your, uh, your personal impact? Uh, and uh, you'll note as we've studied that in a number of areas, and we'll go back and look at that uh, again at a, at a later time. So... Uh, putting it together, uh, uh, we will have this uh, uh, in, in uh, printed form for you, and we will have it available uh, uh, in the book, and it will also be, uh, I'll refer to segments of it from time to time in the days which are ahead. But uh, let's now look at the source of the, of the portfolio of invisible assets, and there are three sources, as I've already indicated in the outline, uh, are in the uh, diagram. One is the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God is the beginning. Now, what is the sovereignty of God? Well, the definition is the, that sovereignty is God's eternal, infinite, perfect, divine volition. Now, God's uh, eternal, infinite, and perfect volition was expressed in the doctrine of divine decrees. This took place in eternity past. The doctrine of divine decrees was made manifest or seen in the dispensations
or the, the dispensation are simply the divine interpretation of history. That's how God looks at history, not how man looks at history. In addition to that, God made a sovereign decision in eternity past to bless all of those who were His. Bless has to do with everything from tranquility, make happy, to providing everything necessary for your life. And so... Uh, God also made a sovereign decision, however, that he would uh, allow the free will of man to make the choice so that he would not receive blessing if he didn't want it. God made a sovereign decision that man could make a choice. Now, whether or not man makes the right choice, we have with the principle of free choice the principle of responsibility. That is, every member of the royal family of God has the opportunity of making his own choice. But you better understand this. Every choice has its own responsibility you're responsible for making that choice. If you make the wrong choice, there are certain uh, things that will come from that. It's, it's given to us in the principle, as a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Then he describes it. We'll study it in great detail if we ever get to Galatians 6 before the rapture, or I'm taken home, uh, and we'll see what happens. Uh, but he says this, He that soweth to the flesh, that is, the energy of the flesh, the old sin nature, the desires of the flesh, to fulfill the, uh, all of the lusts of the flesh, he that sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. That's all you're going to have. You're a loser. Go through life as a loser. But, he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit Reap life everlasting. And that's not salvation. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the escrow blessing that God has for you. Just many ways that God refers to this escrow blessing. But don't ever blame God. There's no such thing as luck. There are no such things as accidents. Everything is in the eternal plan of God and how you are associated to that plan has to do with the, plan, the, the, the work of God in eternity past on behalf of you. Can your choice whether to make doctrine the only revelation of His plan, doctrine, a, a priority of your life? You know, there are people who go through all their life and they never, never... Uh, have experienced some of the wonderful things because they have no capacity to appreciate them. Uh, some people have never learned how to appreciate beautiful music. Uh, I was listening the other evening uh, to, uh, uh, I don't know where we were, as a matter of fact, oh, it was, we were in, in the theater waiting for to watch the movie, and uh, I heard Tchaikovsky's The 1812 Overture. And uh, I just closed my eyes, and I could just picture the various parts uh, of the of the moving drama of Napoleon approaching St. Petersburg uh, and ready to destroy the city, and the people there seeing Napoleon coming as they banded together. And uh, 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 then uh, the uh, uh, you hear the the Marseillaise in the background as they get closer and it gets louder and louder and then you hear the uh, the Russian 
uh, uh, anthem uh, played and, and the, uh, the, the battle between the two and then the cannons start going off as they start to defend their, their country and uh, uh, then you hear the, the bells ringing to symbolize the great victory that was won as, uh, as Napoleon was beaten back and, and you almost feel like standing up and saying, oh, hey, for our side. You know, it's, just, it, it's, it's all there in Tchaikovsky's magnificent music. And there are some people who say, what are those uh, drums? Or, they don't even, they don't know what, is that a real cannon? And if they do it right, they always have a real cannon uh, in the background. Boom! Uh, but it's magnificent. But there's beautiful music. Okay. All kinds of things they don't have capacity to appreciate. Uh, and I'm sure cat lovers think that we dog lovers have no capacity to appreciate cats. And uh, we know that Cat lovers have no appreciation for dogs. Uh, some dogs are better than others. But uh, many things. You people who uh, are uh, shooters uh, or are non-shooters, you don't know what it's like to hold in your hand a beautiful 44 Magnum in, in uh, stainless steel and just caress the barrel, huh, Doc? Just beautiful. It's beautiful. Beautiful. No capacity for those things. Uh, uh, or to aim it at somebody carrying a, as they're walking out of your house, carrying a TV set, your TV set under their arm, and aim it right between the eyes. There's nothing like that in all of life. <laughs> well, I just woke up some listeners on the radio and television. Anyway, the point is, folks, that God, God has some, some things for you that are absolutely fantastic. You see... God is, his sovereignty is said to be uh, related to his infinity. And infinity means that it cannot be uh, bounded, it cannot be limited in any way. And God's sovereignty has come up with boundless ways of blessing you. Ways that are beyond any belief any human, uh, no human mind can ever come up with what God has provided for you. Of course, His Word has revealed some of the things to us. But generally speaking, uh, God has made sovereign decisions in His infinity to do exceeding abundantly above all that you could ask or think which is just the opposite of what people think of as God. They think of God sitting up there uh, on the heaven's throne with a thunderbolt in one hand ready to zap you because you step out of line, uh, or like a great big old Santa Claus, and if you do good, he'll uh, shovel it down to you. And both concepts are wrong. God wants to be bless you. God wants to do wonderful things for you. However... Uh, he, it has to be done on his way. It has to be done by means of, of grace, not by being earned or deserved. And the infinity of God tells you that his sovereignty is unlimited in all that it can do to bless you. Now, the second is the love of God. Since God is sovereign, his divine love is self-motivating. That means he does not look upon you and have pity on you, and so he loves you. He loves you on the basis of who and what he is, not on the basis of you. And therefore, his love is perfect. It's uh, based on perfect integrity, perfect virtue, and it's first of all directed toward himself, but it's not sinful when it's directed toward himself because God cannot do anything sinful. It is also directed toward the other members of the Trinity. And that's fantastic. But just think for a moment that it is directed toward you. You. And that love because of the fact that who and what God is, that love never increases and it never decreases. God never, God's love never decreases because he gets mad at you. God's love never decreases because you goof off, because you, uh, uh, because you fail. Uh, God doesn't turn his back on you and say, well, when you clean up your act, then... No, no, God never looks at you. 
in any way but with perfect, absolute divine love. It's not sustained by anything you do. It's sustained by His character. It's not sustained by your attractiveness or unattractiveness. It's total free from, totally free from any patronizing or condescending influence. It is influenced by nothing. God loves you because of who and what He is. And because He loves you, His sovereign decision is made to bless you, you see. And the third thing He does, or the third characteristic of these invisible assets, providing, coming from His absolutely gracious, wonderful sovereignty, His love has to do with His omniscience. But since there are too many points for me to get in without and leave you halfway through it, I'll pick that up on Thursday evening, and I encourage you not to miss it. Because, you see, in eternity past, God knew, or I should say God knows, I have to use a past and a, and a, and a, and a present tense together, perfectly, eternally, and simultaneously, everything that is knowable, whether it's actual or possible, he knows thoughts, motives, decisions, actions, and he has known them from eternity past. There is nothing that is not known by God. And since he is infinite, his knowledge is infinite, therefore he is going to come up with something that he knows will be for your fantastic joy and blessing. You know, parents want 99% of the time, I, very few parents are like the, the exception, they want the best for their children. And parents will sacrifice many things that they might like to have for themselves so that they can provide for these children whom they love. They, they make certain restrictions. Don't do this because we know that'll hurt you. Don't go here because we know you'll suffer for it. Uh, do this, do that. And then stop to think uh, uh, what parents do. They go into, some parents go into fantastic debt pay all year long to be able to give Christmas gifts to the children that they love uh, or birthday gifts or whatever it may be. They just, they love these children that are theirs and they want to do for them. That's just, that, beloved, is a very, very poor illustration of how God wants to do good for every member of his royal family. He wants to pour abundantly on you everything that he knows will please you and the only limitation is your decisions your choices and you actually can limit what God does for you by the mean by means of your own decisions I pray that you will begin to think in terms of all that God the Father has provided for you in the portfolio of invisible assets. Let us pray. I do thank Heavenly Father for this fantastic provision, this glorious provision that is so wonderful. And I ask that God the Holy Spirit will take the things we've looked at this evening and make them real, understandable and discernible. And may the emotions of believers respond by becoming lost in wonder, love, and praise for such a great and glorious God. In Jesus' name, amen.